and we're back for our second half of our video on natural selection. Natural selection is the second section in our series on evolution. In the first half of this topic, we looked at how Charles Darwin developed his ideas on natural selection as a process to explain evolution. And now we have to put natural selection into action and see it work. And we'll start with the story of the peppered moth. This is a pretty famous example. It's used in most biology textbooks, but we'll go through it anyway. So the peppered moth comes in two variations. We have the lighter colored kind of gray speckled moth and the darker colored moth. And in this environment, in my blue-gray screen here, each of these moths is, is just as likely to be eaten by the birds that can see them against this background. So in this case, nature is not selecting for either the dark trait or the, the light trait because either is um, just as easily seen by the bird. But what if we change the environment? What if the, the bark of the trees that these moths land on is colored like this? And in fact, in the area of the forest where these moths live, um, the bark of the tree is a light color like this with um, a kind of a grayish color, lots of lichens on it, and the light colored moths blend in really well. As a result, nature selects against the dark colored moths. The birds can see them more easily, eat them, therefore they don't survive and reproduce. Whereas the gray colored moths hidden over here survive and reproduce in greater numbers. Nature is selecting for this version of the trait. Until the environment changes, and it did. During the Industrial Revolution, the factories in the area were putting out lots of soot, and the bark of the trees became dark in color, and now the dark colored moth has an advantage. It's being selected for by nature. Now the birds can spot the light colored moths easier, eat them, and we're selecting for the dark colored moth. This pattern of selection, uh, or mode of selection as we're going to say, is often referred to as directional selection. We're going to uh, when the environment selects against one end of the range of a variation. We can go back to our story of our giraffe. And let's imagine that we have a graph here and the, the trait value here is length of neck. And so we see the proportion of the individuals in the population that have a very long neck is short and a very short neck, uh, not a lot have a very short neck, and most are in between. But if we select against one end of the range, what happens? Well successive generations will move this population in a direction. If each generation we select against this end of the range, then the average look of the population will shift. We call that directional selection. So natural selection uh, can explain how a population can change over time. But what's interesting is it can also explain how a population stays the same. We call this stabilizing selection. When the environment selects against both ends of the range of a variation. What will happen? It results in a narrowing of the range. We stabilize the form. So one end of the range is selected against, and the other end is selected against, and the middle is being selected for. So we have a much more narrow range of expression, and we'll stabilize. Now, when will this happen? And can you think of any animals or organisms, I should say, where this has happened? Any, any organisms that have not changed due to natural selection? Well, how about a shark? Sharks haven't changed very much in 65 million years. And what about crocodiles and alligators? They haven't changed very much either. They're basically dinosaurs. So what do they have in common? Oh, and what about this? What about ferns? They're older than both crocodiles and sharks. What do these organisms have in common that has allowed them to not change? How does natural selection explain this stability of form? Think about it. Pause the video and write down two conditions that are required for stabilizing selection to occur. Well, what would you get? Well, first thing is, you have to be well suited for your environment. A shark's pretty much perfect for the environment it lives in. Same with an alligator, and the ferns do really well in their environment. Secondly, the environment can't be changing. The environment that a shark inhabits has been that way for a very, very long periods of time. Now, what it means is, it's hard to improve in a way that can outcompete this middle version of the form. I mean, how could you make this shark better? Give it laser beams? Of course not. So we add stabilizing selection to our modes of selection, directional and stabilizing selection making a species change in a direction, and selection making a species stay the same. Well, what else do we have? 
Our third mode of selection is called disruptive selection. It's when the environment selects against the middle of a range of a variation. And this leads to a divergence. We get a divergence of form, and it may create a dimorphism, two shapes. So I, it's hard to come up with an example of this one, but in our giraffe uh, example, maybe having a really long neck is an advantage because you can get to high leaves, but maybe having a really short neck helps you get down to the low shrubs, but if you're in between, maybe you're selected against. And we'd create two distinct forms, the long neck version and the short neck version, with not a lot in between. Here's another example. Uh, we have these butterflies, and in the middle of the range, there's a color butterfly that um, does not look like a type of butterfly that would make a bird sick, whereas at the other two ends of the range, uh, these butterflies mimic species that would make a bird sick, unpalatable, un, um, that means that they ke you can't eat them. They, they look like a version of a species that would make a bird sick, so the birds avoid this end and this end and select against the middle. And so after a while, you have two very distinct uh, uh, shapes or, or versions of the trait. So we have natural selection in action, three different modes of selection. And we have one other idea to discuss here, and that is, can environmental pressure cause unrelated things to look similar. We call this concept convergent evolution, when non-related species become alike due to similar environmental pressures. How about some examples? Well, a dolphin and a shark are very similarly shaped. Well, they inhabit the same environment, and this body form has become very advantageous or has been very successful in that environment. So they have evolved similarities. And that doesn't mean they're ever going to converge and become one species. We have a mammal and a fish, and we have um, fossil records of an ichthyosaur, a reptile version that is also very similarly shaped, but it, have, it had the same environmental pressures. How about this example? Here are two plants that occupy very similar habitats, and they've evolved very similar characteristics. We call this, again, convergent evolution. It's an example of natural selection in action. So there we go. Our section on natural selection is complete. We discussed the history behind how Darwin developed this idea of natural selection, and then we put it into action. So we know natural selection provides a mechanism by which species can change. It's the how to evolution. But a species changing, or not changing in the, in the case of stabilizing selection, still doesn't explain how new species arise. And that's the topic of our next video. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comment sections below, and I hope you learned something.